this month, which is looking at mental health, which is really important. But today we're going to address children's mental health. And we know that some young children and some young people and children have really enjoyed being off school, but others will have really struggled with a coronavirus outbreak, keeping them at home and away from friends. Others may be coming to terms with family problems and loss of changes in their environment. They've also had periods of time when they're not at school. And as a mother to three daughters, I've seen the impact that can have. It's a time when they should be nurturing friendships. They've been stuck at home. So I'm really pleased that the restrictions are over and we have come to terms with the pandemic, but it has left our children with problems, many of them. And today I'm delighted to invite Dr. Ambrose Wanchiku, who's a um, consultant psychiatrist who specializes in adult psychiatric problems, but also has a really good insight into what affects our children. And I'm hoping that at the end of today, we'll have a bit more um, understanding, knowledge, and also some resources that we can point to when it comes to dealing with mental health problems in our children. So once again, I'd like to invite um, Ambrose Wanchiku and thank you very much for joining us. Um, thank you. Uh, is, there, is someone going to share my slides or do you want me to share that? You're on mute. Team, can you now make Dr. Ambrose? Uh, um, yes, Dr. Dr. Ambrose, you can share your slides, please. Okay. okay. So good morning, everyone. How are you today? I do hope uh, you're keeping well. Um, today, we are going to be talking about child and adolescent mental health. I guess majority of us uh, have children or have a close relative who has children or do work with children. So I do hope that today's presentation will be helpful in some way for you. Uh, my understanding is that, well, uh, by the way, my background is that of a consultant psychiatrist as a, a general adult psychiatrist and a liaison psychiatrist. I also have a, a background in uh, public mental health and uh, substance misuse and medical education. So um, during the presentation, I will try as much as possible to uh, make it as uh, simple as, uh, as I can do, uh, because I'm mindful that the audience is quite uh, uh, pluralistic. So, Hopefully we will address any questions at the end. Yeah, in the world we live in today, uh, there's so much going on, so much uh, that could affect uh, the mental health of communities, of societies. And many a time the uh, minority groups or the deprived groups are affected the most. So we have the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, there's war now going on in Ukraine and Russia. Uh, uh, with the pandemic, there has been increasing a lot of things like uh, 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 deterioration in mental health, uh, self-harm, substance misuse, uh, and all sorts. Um, Black and ethnic minorities uh, in particular uh, have been uh, significantly affected. So uh, I'm not going to be talking about uh, mental disorders in children per se. Uh, uh, my understanding is that uh, uh, this will be addressed uh, in this forum at uh, some time or may have been addressed. But 
I would like to highlight the fact that anxiety disorders uh, are quite common in uh, young people and adolescents, uh, mood disorders uh, like depression. Uh, and then we have the uh, uh, ADHDs and uh, um, autisms, uh, substance misuse and eating disorder. So we're not going to be talking about that today. Rather, we're going to be talking about self-harming adolescents. And I would like to uh, uh, address the extent of the problem in adolescents, uh, the reasons why young people self-harm, and the relationship between self-harm and suicide in young people, impact of social media on self-harm and suicide behaviors in young people. And also we, we will look at uh, approaches to assessment of self and young people. Some of the treatment approaches, uh, the uh, outcomes, and also the help and support that are available. What is self -harm? I would like to, uh, as I progress for people to uh, put in the chat room, uh, maybe who they are, where they're attending from. Uh, uh, my understanding is that there are some pediatricians in the house. There are some psychiatrists. There are some uh, practitioners within uh, child and uh, adolescent, uh, either physical or mental health. There are all sorts of people from various backgrounds. So, uh, what is our understanding of self-harm? There has been a lot of definitions about what it is, but the one that is supported by NICE or Royal College of Psychiatry is that that of self-harm being self-poisoning or injury, irrespective of the apparent purpose of the act. And there has also been several terminologies that have been used, such as direct self-harm, uh, things like uh, suicidal attempts, overdosing, overdosing on tablets, uh, hanging, uh, jumping, such as jumping from a bridge, other self-injuries, uh, wrist and arm cutting, which is quite common. There's also been uh, uh, indirect self-harm terminology used especially when it involves substance misuse, eating disorders. Eating disorder is a, a very big uh, aspect of uh, uh, child and adolescent uh, mental health problem and other risk uh, taking behaviors. So uh, the other terminology is uh, self-harm being a kind of construed to be a kind of deliberate harm. Again, a, a lot of critics have, uh, do not uh, like to uh, uh, perceive self-harm from this uh, point of view because they feel that it is quite uh, pejorative and uh, judgmental. So uh, it is no longer uh, fashionable to uh, describe self-harm as uh, deliberate self-harm. So uh, other terminologies include non-suicidal non uh, self-injury, uh, uh, self-injury disorders, uh, uh, behaviors. So all these uh, terminologies have been variously used either in the UK or uh, in the uh, US, uh, but they're all pointing to one thing. Uh, when people try to uh, hurt themselves in several ways as a result of something going on, so self-harm itself is not a mental disorder, but uh, more or less a symptom of a mental disorder. So we're going to look a, a little bit about the uh, um, uh, epidemiology uh, of self-harm. By this, I mean some of the theories about what, what could lead to self-harm, uh, 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 what makes people self-harm, the statistics, uh, how big a problem it is. So uh, there has been some uh, 
evidence that one in 10 people uh, uh, do engage in self-harming behavior. Uh, and like I said earlier, it's not construed as a, a diagnosis in itself, but a symptom of uh, something else going on. That is why it's very important that uh, a thorough assessment uh, is done to formulate a kind of, uh, not just biological, but uh, psychosocial management uh, that will uh, include the mitigation of race, risks. It is a growing public uh, uh, mental health issue that accounts for approximately about 20,000 pre presentations to hospital each year. This is a huge problem. And in 2014, it, it, it was thought that about 20% of young women reported having ever self harmed. 20% is a very huge uh, number. And this is twice the rate found in young men and three times higher than uh, five years ago. So what this shows is that uh, self-harming behavior is increasing. Self-harming rates were thought to be three times higher than in boys. But this is not an exclusively uh, uh, female uh, girls issue. Uh, as we will see later on, 68% uh, increase in self harm rates in girls were, was observed between 2011 and 2015. So you, you can see that the rates are increasing. Uh, there are no co much current uh, uh, statistics yet, but it has been thought that during this uh, lockdown and other environmental factors uh, that were put in place, such place such as uh, isolations, uh, quarantine, that the rates of self harm uh, did increase across board, both in the adult population, population of, population of those uh, with mental health problem and uh, within the child and adolescent age group. self harm in adolescents were nine times more likely to die of uh, unnatural causes. So that, that's a big problem. And they were 17 times more likely to die of suicide as well than the general population. So you could see uh, these uh, statistics are quite damning. And the reason why it is quite important to um, address them uh, with all the uh, seriousness that it requires. We've mentioned uh, uh, earlier that uh, uh, majority of them are girls, often within the age bracket of 13 to 15 year old. This is a very important um, age group, uh, adolescent age group, when people are trying to move from being a, a girl to being an adolescent and a, a woman, a lady. So uh, there are a lot of things that go on both physiologically uh, developmentally, psychologically, uh, there are hormonal interplays, uh, there are uh, issues about how these girls look as they develop uh, uh, in their physiology. There's also some uh, responsibilities attached to that, uh, psychological impact of that. The UK has uh, there has been evidence that the UK has the highest rate of self-harming behavior in Europe. So that's another reason why uh, I thought it is a huge uh, problem within our societies. Uh, a lot of theories have been uh, uh, you know, put in place to try to explain why this is so. Uh, why is self-harming behavior uh, increasing? Is it due to Western societies? Could it be due to growth of the internet? Are young people becoming uh, progressively unhappy? Are we making our young people unhappy? Is the society making them unhappy? So there's a lot of uh, risk factors that have been associated with uh, self-harm or self-harming behaviors as well. 
some of those uh, uh, family factors, uh, uh, dysfunctional families uh, where there are uh, separation, divorce, uh, domestic violence, gender issues uh, uh, start to be more common in females, ethnicity as well. Um, there hasn't been a robust uh, statistics uh, in the UK to uh, determine if uh, in which ethnic category that uh, self farming behavior is more prevalent. But in the US, it is thought to be more prevalent amongst the uh, Caucasian uh, population. Bullying is a, another strong factor uh, that can predispose people to, towards uh, self farming behaviors. Social factors as well, peer pressures, uh, social economic factors and uh, other things. Abuse, that's another important one. Uh, emotional, physical, or sexual abuse, and most importantly, sexual abuse. So uh, self-harming behavior is a sort of uh, a response to something happening, some, something very, quite traumatic, which the young person might be struggling to deal with. Other things like anniversaries can be quite traumatic. Uh, and when you uh, are aware of this, you can put a proper plan in place. Impulsivity for, the, for those that are quite impulsive, uh, especially in people that uh, have uh, some sort of a imagined or imagined uh, personality disorders, borderline personalities, um, other psychiatric comorbidities. Also, self farm is thought to be more common in those with uh, mental health issues like depression, anxiety, uh, autism, and uh, ADHD. So what are the various uh, uh, types of uh, uh, self farming behavior? There are so many of them. Uh, cutting seems to be one of the more common ones, overdoses. This could be overdoses from uh, over-the-counter medication, paracetamol high on the list. It could be overdosing some prescribed medication. It could also be poisoning people. I've seen people who drink bleaches, who drinks other uh, very dangerous things. Eating disorder uh, is a, a different area per se, uh, uh, where people do restrict their diets. But again, eating disorder has much more to eat, you know, because, uh, 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 people uh, tend to have some sort of uh, body image uh, problems and uh, 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 self-esteem problems. People can restrict their diet uh, as a form of self harm, um, even without having eating disorders. So hanging and self-strangulation using uh, ligatures is another one uh, more common within the male population. Others are burning, uh, head banging. Uh, head banging uh, uh, could be more common within uh, uh, people who have autism and all those neurodevelopmental disorders. Heating uh, or biting, uh, pulling of a trichotillomania uh, can be co common as well. And uh, now that we've uh, talked about uh, uh, self harm as a, a problem and uh, some of the uh, uh, theories about the etiology of possible causes or reasons why people self harm. Uh, it, it will be very important to uh, 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 you know understand some of the signs, red flags that could indicate, uh, could make us suspicious about uh, or could uh, trigger or uh, predispose people to self harming behavior. Uh, we are in full. Uh, Coverage clothing, even in where hot weather, might be aware of concealing uh, self harm, uh, especially uh, uh, caught in uh, depression and anxiety, as we mentioned uh, earlier. And when young people suddenly withdraw, uh, parents or uh, uh, guardians or carers should be worried about that and try to uh, uh, be a bit more. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, keep their eyes on the ground to find out whether there's anything happening. Uh, weight loss as well is another one. Frequent illnesses, 
sometimes school refuse her, you know, uh, refusing to go to school. Uh, hair loss, so we've mentioned the hair pulling, uh, body tissues in the, bloody tissues in the rubbish. That's a very interesting one. So if you find bloody tissues in the bin, maybe you, you might start wondering what is going on, especially when there are other signs uh, as highlighted on this slide. Low self-esteem, we've talked about in eating disorders, low mood, Expressing feelings of uh, failure and uh, self load can be another one as well. So why do young people self-harm? I guess this is a very uh, difficult uh, um, thing to uh, explore. And oftentimes the parents, uh, school practitioners, pediatricians find it very difficult to uh, ask people about why they so if I'm actually, this should be part of the assessment uh, to find out the reasons why they say farm. Various people might say farm for various uh, reasons and uh, practitioners should not uh, shy away from uh, asking people uh, uh, why they say farm. It could be a form of communication of unmet needs, in which case, if we're able to address those needs, maybe uh, self um, uh, behavior can reduce. It could be a relief from a terrible state of mind, it could, uh, maybe traumas that they couldn't uh, uh, contain, especially mental traumas. They don't know how to deal with. It could be a kind of a, a, a physical way of uh, uh, dealing with it. Uh, oftentimes, people that self harm tell us that they, fe they feel a form of uh, relief after cutting or self harming. It could be uh, that they want to punish themselves or blame themselves for failures or, or for being abused. Uh, and it could be a form of dissociation as well. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, to deal with trauma or advice, uh, life experiences. And uh, amongst all, uh, the huge one among them is that it could be a, a, a sign that they are struggling with their mental health, be it in terms of emergent personality disorders, depression, or post-traumatic uh, stress disorders. So uh, it could be a way of coping, uh, 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 you know, a dormal adaptive. Sometimes um, it could be a health helpful on quote, where of coping uh, and the protection from uh, completed suicide. Uh, young people who self-harm themselves have given reasons uh, uh, why they do, do so, such as family problems, uh, bullying at school. So uh, every bullying at school should be taken seriously because it affects the mental health of uh, young people so much. Could be general unhappiness or depression. I know within our black and uh, ethnic minority population, a lot of times parents want their children to be professionals in various fields. It might be that a young person have a different idea or agenda what they want to be, and then feel pressured to becoming what their parents want them to be. So it might be a sign of uh, protest or revolt or struggling to deal with uh, uh, you know, what families want them to do in terms of their careers as well. Yeah, it could be a, a reaction or it, uh, 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 it could be like a, a outcome from abuse, you know. Some people are also very sensitive, uh, you know, uh, in such, such that they, they can take the slightest things to heart. So uh, it might be one of the reasons why they say farm as well. Um, I, I called this uh, table from the Real College of Psychiatry uh, website uh, on safe farm and suicide risk uh, behavior. Uh, uh, you could see it highlighted uh, quite some important factors. Some of them we have uh, talked about earlier on the contextual factors. Uh, that can affect uh, uh, or predispose people to suicidal behavior, uh, mental health problems, like we mentioned, individual factors. Uh, it could be in the genes, you know, uh, running families. Uh, 
you know, personality issues, family factors like separation, mental illness, social factors, isolation, loneliness, uh, cultural factors uh, more common within the Caucasian groups, you know, uh, you know uh, autonomy, language, uh, identity barriers. Uh, uh, within the uh, uh, minority groups can be a factor as well. Exposure to trauma, like we mentioned, life events, uh, financial problems, unemployment, bereavement, uh, discrimination, marital issues, socioeconomic as well. Uh, and the uh, structural factors. So, uh, on this table as well, uh, 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 highlights uh, uh, some of the uh, 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 reasons uh, why young people say um, uh, uh, it highlights their motives. Uh, and you could see they, they just try to explore uh, self cutting uh, uh, versus self poisoning and then check the uh, motives that young people. Uh, reported for reasons why they caught or uh, why they have taken a, a poison or overdose. So uh, uh, escape from a terrible state of mind came top on the list. Uh, intention to, to die is huge. 40% in self cutting and about 66 in self-poisoning. So uh, there's that one. Uh, there have been some myths as well uh, regarding uh, self-harm and self-harming behavior. Uh, in the society, people think it, it is a, a teenage girl issue. That's not correct. Uh, and they can uh, also think it's a, a form of attention-seeking behavior, especially within our uh, minority and uh, Black and minority ethnic groups. Oftentimes, parents feel frustrated, uh, uh, feel angry and happy uh, about that. They think that their uh, young uh, um, uh, children, uh, persons are trying to seek attention uh, or trying to manipulate. Mm. Another myth is that uh, self harm uh, behavior uh, is not harmful to young people. That's not true, as we have seen that some of them could lead to deterioration in their uh, mental health, affect their education, future careers, and also lead to that. Uh, it has also been thought to be just a, a, a fad, which is not true as well. So, uh, uh, the people think it's probably something trending, fashionable, you know, that's not correct. Mm. Actually, uh, 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 conversely, some people might think so also that uh, self harm is always uh, mm, attempted suicide, that's not correct as well. Uh, or that young people who self harm has a borderline uh, personality disorder, that's not correct, as we've seen. Or the young people who talk about suicide never attempt or complete suicide, that's not correct as well. So all these uh, myths, uh, it is important that we debug them and to make you all aware of this. In terms of formulation about uh, 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 people uh, self-harm, uh, apart from the presenting problem, uh, the predisposing factors, the triggers or the maintaining factors. Uh, uh, there is what we call protective factors as well. Uh, what could protect people against uh, self-harming behaviors, uh, uh, suicide? Uh, one of them is uh, uh, robust uh, personal resources, mm -hmm. such as uh, emotional resilience, uh, strong connections, uh, therapeutic communities, uh, supportive relationships. Uh, I must say that within the black and minority ethnic group, oftentimes uh, the uh, strong cohesion is thought to be perhaps the reasons why uh, uh, self harming mean, behavior might not be as predominant. Mm. Evidence of ability to, to problem solving skills and coping a kind of a, a positive adaptive coping strategies when people are faced with challenges is thought to be protective. Restrictive access to little means of uh, self-harm and uh, suicide is another one. And access to supportive mental health, care and therapeutic relationships. And if young people are happy and enjoying uh, 
uh, their education, good environment, uh, uh, or working that could be protected. And people who naturally, premorbidly have a good sense of humor are thought to, to be less likely to, to self harm. Life affirming beliefs that discourage suicide and support self preservation. Things like uh, a religion, you know, faith uh, can be a strong factor because some of the uh, 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 common uh, religions and faith uh, frown against uh, suicide you know, attempts to, for people to end, take their life. A positive attitude to mental health and self um, uh, expressed by key family members. So when family members have a very good uh, positive understanding about uh, uh, you know, uh, self-harm or how to deal with their young uh, person's uh, mental health, it, it is thought to be uh, uh, quite protective. That brings uh, us to the uh, point of how do we assess uh, self-harm? A key factor is to, uh, like I mentioned earlier, ask the young person why they self-harm, uh, because intent can vary, as we mentioned earlier. And we said also that cutting could be a way of coping. There's what we call imitation behavior. This is more predominant among the looked after children that live in a, a kind of residential settings, hostels. Uh, that is why perhaps that uh, uh, we don't encourage uh, admitting people just for uh, uh, self-harm as uh, it, they can learn those uh, um, behaviors even while on the ward. Uh, it is quite important for practitioners to feel quite confident in uh, assessing uh, uh, self harm. Do not feel scared to ask. You know, uh, 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 each uh, uh, self harm act can mean uh, uh, different thing for different persons. So, uh, professionals working with young people who self harm need to understand that um, the, what is the function that self harming behavior is. Uh, uh, doing for that young person. So understand, under, understanding that is quite central and key to engagement, risk management and interventions as well. So parents and carers should be very much involved in the assessment process. We've mentioned again, conversion of the young person uh, 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 to uh, self-harming in inpatient settings. Uh, Actually, uh, staff can manage self-harming behavior uh, better in the community. All young people should, should have a kind of a mutual safety plan where young, uh, that will uh, involve uh, young persons, their families, their school, maybe a &E, the GP, uh, and all those that are involved in the uh, care and safety of the child. Sometimes even safeguarding teams are involved. Uh, the method and frequency of uh, current and past self harming behaviors are quite important. So, past psychiatry history is important, past self harming behaviors, and the uh, antecedents, the contents in, in which they occurred, uh, like uh, comorbid mental health problems and uh, their relationship to self harm, such as depression or any other psychiatry uh, illnesses, is uh, quite uh, important as well. Personal and social content, uh, we mentioned it earlier. What is the antecedent? What is the context uh, in which uh, these uh, young people have self-harmed? Uh, self-harm, uh, the, the, the reasons why people, or uh, the relationship between self-harm and suicide in young people uh, 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 might not be very clear, uh, 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 whether they want to end their life or not. Self-harm is not uh, uh, the same as suicide. They are two different things. Uh, however, the way we would like uh, you to see it today is a, as a sort of continuum uh, from that, those kind of uh, fleeting thoughts of self-harm to maybe a more frequent and intense self-harming behavior. And then at the other end of the extreme is uh, completed suicide. Uh, 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 consider the higher risk factors like uh, frequency, method of self-harm, the lethality and the uh, severity. Uh, self-harm is the uh, biggest risk factors for completed suicide as well. So it's quite uh, 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 very important. Uh, it could be very anxiety provoking for uh, practitioners who assess people with uh, 
uh, self, um, uh, it, it is okay to say, did you, want to, did you want to be dead? How do you feel now? What will stop you from doing that? So get them to describe it in their own words uh, and not to be scared to talk about it. Uh, uh, you have lost a young person if you if you can manage to engage with them. Always involve their parents in the assessment process because sometimes young pe- persons and parents may be coming from uh, different angles. So you need to hear them. You need to listen to them. So. So, and what are the role of uh, uh, psychiatrists and people working, pediatricians uh, uh, or people working within the multidisciplinary team? It is important to feel very confident and competent to assess, uh, 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 make a robust assessment, uh, as we mentioned earlier, bearing in mind the complexities of uh, risk, uh, regular and frequent presenters with low to moderate level of self-harming behaviors, are the most difficult to manage. Sometimes we can misconstrue it that uh, they are unlikely to complete suicide, but that, that, that's not true in some, some cases. So it is important that you carry out a robust assessment. Uh, multiple self-harming behavior is very significant risk factor for completed suicide, as we mentioned. And it's important to explore and diagnose those underlying uh, mental health problems, as we mentioned earlier. So any mental health problem, c- can uh, feature with self-harming behavior uh, uh, and it's not a medical disorder as we've mentioned. Medicalizing it therefore by prescribing for it, uh, it can be quite difficult and give uh, different messages for the young person, for their families and for the team. So it's important to to understand that, uh, especially for uh, practitioners. It could be anxiety provoking, as we mentioned, for people in camps, especially, ah, can I allow, allow this young person to be managed in the community? What if they go back home and uh, uh, do that again, and then that leads to suicide? Uh, so often parents are, are hugely anxious and expect something to be done, and now, uh, and when you tell families that these young people can be supported in the community, they don't want to deal with that. Uh, they don't want to be given that responsibility to keep an eye on them in, at home. They, 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 they are very scared, you know, they, 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 they highly express their emotions and anxiety is so huge. Yeah, they, were, they might want their, their young person to be immediately uh, hospitalized uh, and intense, intensive treatment uh, started, uh, you know, immediately. So also the therapeutic nature of the assessment process is a very important uh, thing. If you listen to the young persons, their families, if you engage very well with them, it can be therapeutic in itself. And it, you, it can give you the opportunity to educate them, uh, to give, administer psychoeducation. Uh, self-harm is a topical issue, as we know, especially with the pandemic. Uh, and uh, amongst uh, uh, one of the uh, re- uh, theories why people self-harm is that of the uh, access to internet and social media. Uh, wait, I don't think internet and social media is all bad. It could be a source of education as well for the uh, young person. So it's not all that bad. Uh, Ministers uh, recently, this was published uh, on the 12th of April, a couple of days ago, that they are concerned about misleading and dangerous content uh, uh, online uh, 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 as, uh, as, uh, as demand for mental health services reaches record high. So again, uh, uh, you could see that it's a very important problem. Uh, it, like I said, it could be harmful or helpful, uh, uh, but research evidence uh, is quite limited. It, it could be positive if they feel disconnected and uh, if they don't fit in and lonely, uh, they could use self harm as a form of recreation, you know, to, for social uh, interaction. Uh, a lot of therapies, especially during this pandemic, has been delivered online. Wow, a lot of them really were virtually delivered, you know. And for people who find it uh, 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 very difficult to engage face to face, it's been uh, helpful for them. It could be unhelpful as well, you know, when they see images on uh, ways uh, to save harm. Uh, 
So clinicians should ask them about their internet uh, use. So, um, yeah, uh, 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 there has been some research in, in, in that regard as well about exposures to internet and the role of uh, social media. Uh, uh, you know, we've talked about uh, management of self harm, uh, how we should involve uh, everybody involved with uh, looking after that child, how it is important to evaluate environmental factors and have a proper formulation. Uh, uh, you know, uh, recognizing emotionally unstable personality disorder. Uh, and in terms of longer outcome of uh, self harm, uh, 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 there has been some evidence that group therapy programs can be helpful. And uh, also some sh brief interventions, three to uh, 12 sessions. Uh, it is not best managed in hospital. You can take that home today. Uh, uh, longer term input in the community can be helpful. So uh, this is a table I'll be uh, uh, willing to share my uh, slides after the presentation for you to have a look. This is a table about uh, uh, emergency management of self harm depending on the age category. Uh, uh, this is more like a table on uh, what you should do. Uh, uh, is comes really fit for purpose, access to uh, uh, mental health, uh, only about 25% of young people are having access. So a lot of them don't get uh, uh, to the health uh, care providers and uh, uh, you know they're not getting the treatment and help they require. And that was why the government brought uh, the Future in Mind program, which wanted to look at uh, uh, the information the young people access, the vulnerable groups, you know, and also uh, increase investment and the deliver mental health in schools, I apt in schools, you know, uh, remove stigma, discrimination, support them more, uh, encourage equality and diversity, and have some apps uh, for young people uh, to support their mental health. So the Young in Mind came up in 2015, and the, 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 the plan is by 2020 would have achieved its purpose. I don't know whether it has done, maybe our CAMS colleague will uh, tell us a bit more about that. Uh, uh, some patients have uh, shared their experiences about the services they received, uh, uh, and uh, also uh, uh, their guidance or their um, uh, parents have also shared that, especially for those who self harmed or who completed suicide. There are some self help and support groups available. Uh, once you type in self harm on the internet, you'll be surprised that it, uh, some returns, uh, uh, phone number 116123 will come on board. Do you need help? Do you want to talk to someone? So these are some of the child line as well. Uh, uh, there is rethink. There are so many of them uh, that can be quite supportive. So you could uh, access them. Some of them run 24 uh, hours. And you can access them from anywhere in Europe, even while you're on holidays. So in summary, self harm is not a medical disorder. It is a symptom of an, an unmet need in young people. Uh, self harm in the UK is uh, increasing and has reached epidemic proportions. Therefore, uh, it must be taken seriously and a robust careful assessment is quite important. Uh, majority of self-harming episodes are a response to some psychosocial issues. So self-harm may be a method of coping and regulating emotions. It is important to screen for underlying serious mental health uh, 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 that needs to be uh, treated. It is the biggest predictor. Predictor of completed suicide, therefore, provides significant opportunity for intervention. Uh, I have a lovely poem here written by one of the uh, uh, higher trainees in psychiatry who doubles as a family friend. She wrote it a few days ago, which I thought could be helpful for you to uh, encourage you. Uh, thank you. I will stop sharing. Thank you very much. So we've got about um, 15 minutes, 20 minutes for some questions now. Um, and there are quite a number of questions in the chat. So thank you so much for your talk, um, Dr. Wanchiku. Um, so I'm going to go to the questions. There are, the first one is um, 
a question about the proportion of BME children, uh, children from a Black and African Caribbean heritage that have mental health issues. We heard last week that for adults, it's quite significantly more in the Black community. So is that the same for children? There has been no robust uh, uh, statistics that I'm aware of. Uh, maybe my CAMS colleagues or pediatricians can come as well. But in trying to uh, explore that, there has been no robust uh, research that uh, specifically highlighted the uh, 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 kind of prevalence of mental health uh, problems within the Black and minority ethnic populations. Uh, I'm aware that with the adult population, it seems to be predominant within the uh, uh, BEM groups and even uh, issues like the application of the Mental Health Act and uh, the sections are my, my, quite predominant, but I'm not very aware if there has been a kind of robust uh, body of evidence, uh, evidence-based uh, research that uh, tend to highlight the uh, uh, extent of the that problem. Means, thank you. So does that mean that whatever strategies that we're using, there's nothing that you have specifically for um, the Black community? Just to reiterate, the, the, um, the people who usually log on to this, well, it's, a, it's a very diverse group of you, as you've mentioned, there's some health practitioners, but this is predominantly for people to take um, more control of their own issues. And you know, in our community, we have a saying that it takes a village to, to raise a child, and that is even more so in the black community. And so even if there are people here who directly do not have children themselves who are affected by these issues, um, you're interested in the health of your nieces, nephews, children's, um, children of your friends and family. And so there are people here that have logged on one because you want to know a little bit more about it, but also are really interested in what you do. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things you've talked about is um, the, um, the role of uh, social media. And that's one aspect that has concerned lot, quite a lot of parents. Um, and you've said that there are positives and negatives about social media. But I think when it comes to mental health, the thing that we worry about as parents, I can speak as a parent myself here, is the impact of social media. So what strategies can we, we use? Are there particular things that we can do um, about looking at the role of social media. I've actually seen some recent adverts highlighting the issues of social media in our children's mental health. Yeah, uh, as I highlighted in that uh, uh, kind of media uh, highlight, uh, uh, the society in the UK feels that the MPs are delaying in trying to promulgate uh, uh, laws that will deal with uh, regulation of social media, especially as it relates to children. Uh, by the way, this space, I'm, I'm happy if anybody wants to come in and uh, contribute. What I do know is that the Royal College of Psychiatry has brought up uh, a, a, a kind of uh, information about uh, uh, social media use and how that impacts on mental health. Uh, sometimes we find out that not just mental health, it can impact on physical health, their eyesight, uh, if they stay on the internet for longer hours. If you see, uh, sometimes we do accuse the uh, uh, people that develop social media as only being solely responsible. That's not true. Responsibility lies on parents, guardians, those that are in charge uh, to look after the welfare and safety of the child as well. If you look at things like TikTok, uh, things like all those media, if some of these young people put their actual age, it will refuse them from having an account. But what they do to circumvent that is that they put adult age to log ages to log into that. Again, it's difficult to uh, determine who is an adult or not. You see, so I think uh, families have a lot to play in keeping an eye on what their young people watch, what the, their use of social media space, because they learn about self-harming behaviors there. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm sure that's true, that many parents will be struggling with the balance between, you know, having access to social media and making sure that they don't go on websites that are harmful. Um, one of the things, a current theme throughout all our talks is access to health for people from a, from a 
black um, background. Do you think there are particular issues with accessing health um, treatments and therapies for our children who develop mental health issues? And the reasons why I say that, you said that there doesn't seem to be a difference in, in um, presentation. Is that, do you think there might be anything that is stopping children from coming forward? Are they presenting later than other, other um, groups? Mm. I find it difficult to, to believe that if it's so prevalent in parents, and our speakers last week said that a really big risk factor was parental mental health. Yes. So if we have a, a, quite a lot for parents and then we, that doesn't translate to children. So it, may, it might be that adage that I've just talked about that it takes a village that that's protected for our children. But uh, do you think there's anything about referrals? Because there's someone that's put in the um, questions that mm. what she's experienced is that her GP doesn't take her child's mental health seriously. And she's yeah. been quite a number of times. So in your experience, are, are there any problems about access and how we can overcome this? Yeah, uh, we can look at it from uh, two perspectives. Uh, one is that... Uh, Across board, whether it's physical or mental health, uh, uh, there's this kind of uh, 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 theory that is being held. I don't know whether it is backed by a body of evidence that uh, black and minority ethnic uh, populations seems to be late in accessing health care in general, uh, and mental health is not left behind. And this cuts across board, whether it's within the adult population or within the child and adolescent population. Uh, part of that is that uh, we tend to be culturally and uh, religiously, we tend to be quite religious, and many a time people want to do it from a kind of spiritual a construct or religious point of view, prayers in their pastors, and then before, when it's getting out of hand, then they present late. The a long duration of untreated psychosis, sometimes I do see them uh, present uh, to my world as very late within the black group, unlike when you compare to the white population. Um, I think uh, there, there is uh, not enough services for children in general. And uh, especially, I don't know whether uh, the attitude towards uh, a black or minority et 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 ethnic group might be born out of uh, racial discrimination. I don't know, but it could be because there is uh, uh, the theory of unconscious bias, which uh, systemic bias, which has been recognized. So it might be with some of the explanations for all this. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much, um, Dr. Ilonzo. He, this is a GP who said that he's found it really difficult handing over care of children that come to his practice to the child and adolescent mental health services. Um, and they're really worried about poor services and delayed services. And I think this has been made much worse by the pandemic where the, the waiting lists have just mushroomed. Um, so what, what can people do in the interim? So if you have a GP who's referred and it's a very long waiting list, I mean, I'm sure there are parents out here thinking, what else can I do in the interim while I'm waiting for these, for these services to act, to act for access to these services? Yeah, that's a very important question. Uh, 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 amongst the reasons why the future in mind uh, was, uh, uh, you know, that task force was set up by the Department of Health in 2015 was to address some of these issues that you highlighted, uh, access to, uh, 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 prompt access to uh, mental health services for the young uh, population, young and adolescent population. For uh, a parent, it is quite important, in addition to what we've uh, talked earlier, to watch your young people closely, to observe for any changes in behavior, negative ones most especially, to uh, uh, a kind of, if you can get access to GP, there are uh, any when they present in crisis, uh, ambulance services, there are crisis teams when they present in uh, crisis. Also, there are these uh, support groups and helplines like uh, Rethink. They can support both the young people, the Samaritans, and even their carers. So, and if you're not sure of what to do, they can, if you share your concerns, they can help you. There are safeguarding teams as well. Uh, there's uh, a, a lot of uh, a kind of uh, uh, self-help groups you could uh, try to access. Actually, accessing those self-help groups can even 
uh, have, uh, they can even help you to get uh, quicker access to uh, mental health services within the child and adolescent population. So it might be a way to circumvent that kind of uh, bureaucracy or difficulty with accessing their GPs. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think the other thing that families might struggle with is, I think you've given examples of what you can do in the acute phase, um, but trying to recognize what the difference is between just a surly teenager. You know, we've all met the teenager who just grunts and stays in their room and is usually very, very antisocial because that's what teen teenagers do. And it's really to help you to recognize those signs of when it becomes a bit more of a problem. Um, so we're not at the A&E stage. You're somewhere between thinking, oh, is this a problem or not? And you've, you've gone to your GP. What about counseling services? Are they, are they widely available? Is that sort of an intermediary step that families could use while you're waiting for us? I know you're a psychiatrist, so I, I don't know what your views about this, and this is just a question that's been sent to me. Yeah, I have a very, uh, I come from a public health background as well. I, I'm very much interested in the public mental health. And uh, I, I have young people myself, I have three kids. Uh, I'm aware and I'm mindful that in the local community where I live, uh, uh, child and adolescent services, and even uh, social support in the community. Some of this has been handed uh, over to private practitioners and uh, uh, charities, and, uh, and uh, their funding has been massively cut. So they are not almost uh, non-existent. They are not available. So, uh, and I guess that was why this uh, feature in mind was brought into place, whether they have achieved the purpose is in question. Whether CAMS is fit for purpose as it is currently run has, uh, has been a, a topic of debate. I don't think uh, there are enough services, the Lord, for these young people. My experience working in a very busy a &E in liaison psychiatry is 16 to 18 year olds, which is uh, even the predominant population of people that say farm. There isn't services available for them. Sometimes we toss them between the camps and the uh, general adult population. Where will they be admitted? Who should look after them? Is it the adult liaison? Is it the camps group? And many often than not, they are caught in between with nothing to, to support them. In terms of psychological uh, uh, support, Future in Mind uh, recommended that CAMS, uh, that IAP should be available in schools. I don't know, maybe my CAMS colleagues or pediatricians can help me. Is this happening? Is CAMS as robustly available in schools as it should be? Uh, I, I don't know. So that's a, a question for people to reflect on. Thank you. So one of the questions that has come up actually, you're saying that it says, do you feel that schools are doing enough to identify these issues earlier? Um, because the schools have access to our children for quite a long period of time in the day. They can also uh, look at changes in behavior. Uh, do you see referrals coming from the school system? Unfortunately not, unfortunately not. And this is a cause for uh, worry. Most of the times, uh, schools don't want to be involved. They want to pass the buck to parents. And as you rightly said, these young people spend majority of their useful time in school. By the time they come back, they're tired, you know. And uh, uh, there's not enough, uh, 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 you know, school nurses available. School nurses were trained in mental health, in, in, in kind of uh, uh, teasing out these nitty gritties, red flags psychological support of these young people. So it's not available, sadly, from my own uh, uh, experience. Thank you. Well, we, we seem to have opened a big, big kind of worms here. If we, we, I mean, we've, got a whole, we've had a whole session looking at all the issues that can happen with child mental health. In actual fact, what we've ended up by saying is that there isn't actually the capacity in our NHS to take on the majority of these problems. So that has just left us with a, a gap. Um, which really is not, not good enough, is it? Yeah, I think we are failing our young people, the, our young population. Without a healthy child and adolescent, you will not have a healthy community. That, that is the, the truth. And the future is actually bleak 
for these uh, innocent young people whom we have failed, whom the uh, public and the uh, uh, politicians have failed sadly. So uh, I guess uh, it, it behoves us uh, as parents, as guardians, as people who are uh, entrusted with uh, uh, protecting the health and safety of the children and the younger population to do whatever is in our power, these practical means to, to help and support our young people. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think this is a very good note to end on, actually. <laughs> to say that we, we've identified lots of problems, and but but perhaps um, what I always like to, to um, have in all our sessions is something so, so sort of key take home messages for the, the people have tuned in to listen to this today. So as I said, we have a, a number of people, but the people we, um, we're really here for are the custodians of our children who will be parents and families. And so when you came today, what would you think were the more, most important key messages you'd like to set out for parents that are listening today about looking after the mental health of their children? The key message is don't give up. If society fails, don't be part of it. Don't fail our young people. There are uh, quite uh, some practical things you can do to help and support as much as you can. All those uh, helplines, self-help groups. Uh, um, being a good parent is not just providing for their physical needs. It also involves providing for their mental health needs. And you can do that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I think it's the um, the issues about providing for their mental health needs because with everything else that's going on and some of it's been taken out of our hands, you know, we were part of this or just sides, side, um, bystanders looking at this COVID pandemic two years ago, we weren't aware of all the implications that it would have. You know, it came along and we are really aware of all the health implications, what it's done to adults and their physical health. But I think the mental health scars it's left on our children were not anticipated at the beginning of it, especially the impact on not being able to go to school and mix with friends and have basically almost two years of their formative years just taken away from them, really. Um, the other thing that someone's um, said here that the um, that it doesn't seem that in their opinion, thank you for, very much for, for your um your contribution, Jennifer, and think she's had to leave now. But she was saying that mobiles in schools, and maybe this is incumbent on all of us, wherever we have the ability to influence. Um, I know there are lots of people here who are not just uh, parents, they're people who have influence in our society, including the Caribbean African Health Network. I see somebody's asked what that acronym stands for. And Charles, thank you for clarifying what it is. It's to exert this influence to try and ensure that our children get access to these services when, when we require them because our, our children are our future. And so it is really, um, really, really not, um, it's not, it, it's something that we really have to try and tackle. It's not acceptable that we listen to, we hear these problems and, and do nothing about it. Um, are there any, the other things that we've heard about as well, that's what the other thing I wanted to ask you is that we've heard sometimes in some specialties that by having a black practitioner looking after um, a black patient, that these patients tend to do better. Is there, are there a lot of um, black um, pediatric psychi psychiatrists who can perhaps tease out some of the problems that our children present to differently? Because it interested me to say that the protective factors that we don't have access to some of the really harmful things that other people might have. Um, so with these protective factors, I, I, I feel that there might be a problem with the referrals. So having black pediatric psychiatrists, does that help at all? In fact, that's a very important question, uh, uh, Ngozi. Um, psychiatry happened to be one of the uh, uh, specialties I will term as uh, uh, we are blessed in because uh, majority of the practitioners there come from uh, BEM groups. There's quite a lot of black uh, psychiatrists, uh, practitioners. Uh, having said that, there is a very 
acute shortage of CAMs uh, uh, practitioners uh, across board, across the nation. And a lot of uh, uh, things have been done by the Royal College of Psychiatry to uh, uh, encourage people to go directly into CAMs, even from their first year of specialty training and uh, as a run through. Uh, that's number one. I have seen a few of my patients feel that they feel encouraged when I walked to the world and they saw that the consultant on the world was somebody of their type. And that improved their engagement, that imp improved their uh, ability to uh, uh, a kind of uh, be managed better on the world. Uh, uh, you know, a kind of uh, psychologically, uh, it, it had a lot of impact on them. And uh, many a time when they see me on uh, pass through the world, Dr. Ambrose, hello, uh, they will be the ones that will scream or shout. Uh, that connection is powerful. And, and I even feel it, 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 it is so powerful, uh, you know, having somebody identify as their type, uh, uh, you know, being in charge. Uh, that could be, uh, it is like having uh, professors uh, who are Blacks and you're a medical student. I do medical school interviews and uh, I, 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 I am one of the Black people who are po probably the only Black person who, who does that within Sheffield Medical School. And uh, 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 many a time when uh, the Black students see me, they smile. That alone makes them much more relaxed. It, it has a psychological and powerful uh, emotional effect and connection on them. So I think even though I don't know whether there's the evidence base for this, but I think from uh, my practice and reflecting on that, absolutely there is a, a relationship between uh, having somebody of your type look after you in mental health. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, just on that, and since you're in the medical school, do you think that there is enough cultural and racial education for training, training psychiatrists and within the medical school? I am part of... Uh, any to start off with, and then we can decide yeah, whether there's enough. Yeah. Is there any? Yeah. Uh, if, uh, during the pandemic, the medical students uh, across the nation wrote to us, uh, their lecturers, asking us, that they want a change about the history of medicine to reflect some of the ills that we are done to black and minority populations. That the type of history of medicine that we are taught were all lies. They never mentioned that people were used as guinea pigs. Why are they scared to do that? So I am part of decolonizing the curriculum for both undergraduate and postgraduate medical school. Uh, and uh, uh, from my experience going through that process, I, I realized that young people want the narrative to change. Young people want to be involved. Young people want uh, uh, the, the actual story you know, to be told. They want uh, the, both sides of the story. They, they want to be heard. They don't like, they, they are aware of the dangers of a single story. So I, I, I guess it's, uh, uh, very important, yeah, that we, uh, we from the BEM and minority ethnic po populations, the, the young people are, are, are able to access the education, uh, uh, access uh, uh, the trainings that they require, yes. Thank you. So I'm gonna round up now. Thank you so much for another interesting talk. I feel that um, whilst we've got some take home messages, like everything else in our society, there's an interlink between the so social and the physical aspects of health. I'd encourage parents to get involved with their school affairs. Um, raising our children, the adage is it takes a village to raise a child. And therefore we need to really get involved in school affairs. Um, how many people on this have thought about being a school governor? How many of them go in and advocate, really advocate on behalf of their children? Because as you've said, our children spend quite a long time in school. How many of us have an intimate knowledge about our children's friends and who they're associating with? We have high exclusion in schools. Um, you know, so all these are things that can actually help to um, have a positive impact with our children. So that's school. But again, every session we, we look at, we also talk about diet, exercise, 
exercise with your children, have family meals with them, because all these things will have a positive impact on their, on their mental health. Thank you for those of you that have joined us today. This will be available on YouTube. Every, every, we have these sessions every week. Someone's asked whether we're going to have another one. We have a different session every week and this month is Mental Health Month. And that's why all our sessions have been focused on our mental health. And um, once again, thank you for coming, Dr. Wanchiku. I'm going to hand over back to the canteen. Thank Please you. fill in the um, feedback because it's very important that we evaluate our sessions. Thank you so much. And um, over to counting. Thank you very much, Dr. Ngozi, for that. And thank you, Dr. Ambrose, for coming today to give us this very insightful presentation. It's um, very, very informative. Thank you. I'm just going to run you through our activities for this week quickly. And just to say that next week, we've got another presentation by Dr. Ambrose Wachuku. He'll be talking on post-traumatic distress disorder, PTSD. And that's next Saturday, 23rd April from 11 to 12.15. So please join us again for another um, Catholic Health Hour and you listen to Dr. Ambrose Wachuku next week. Thank you. We also have our Healthy Heart session, which comes up on Tuesdays. So in that session, you learn a lot about um, keeping your heart healthy as it the name says, and it also talk, you also get to do some exercises after that. Next week, we have a really good session. Uh, we've got a cooking masterclass, so please be sure not to miss out on that next week. So that's Tuesday, uh, next Tuesday, 19th of April. Please be sure to join us for our Healthy Heart session. Also, we've got some uh, other events coming up, but before then, I'll just um, say we've got our counseling service, which is available. 9 a.m. to 6, 9 p.m. every day. And you can call us or text us on 07710-022382 for our counseling services, as well as our family advocacy and support services as well. So we've also got a suicide campaign running and just relating to what Dr. Ambrose has talked about, a lot of young people are facing some difficulties. So you can also call our helpline if you know anyone who is having some mental health issues or having suicidal thoughts, please email us at um, help at can.org.uk. And you can also call us on 07710022382. And then quickly on other events, we've got our Windrush event coming up in June, on the 25th of June. We are happy to welcome everyone from the community. So please feel free to contact us if you want to be part of it. We're looking forward to that on Saturday, 25th of June from 12 to 6 p.m. at Alexandra Park. We're looking forward to that event. We've got some other events, so you can check our, uh, we've got e-bulletin that goes out. So if you want to be part of that, you can subscribe to our e-bulletin, just email us as well. You can email us at events at can.org.uk for other information on our events. Uh, we've got one last event, our One Manchester Housing event is coming up on the 26th of April. And if you'd like to learn about housing pathways, please attend our event as well. That's on Tuesday, 26th of April from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. So we, once again, I thank you all for joining us. Uh, my colleagues will just post in the Zoom chat. And um, if you're joining on Facebook and um, and YouTube, you can find some more information about our services and events coming up. So once again, I want to say a big thank you to Dr. Ambrose Wachuku. Thank you, Dr. Ngozi Osage for presenting today. And thank you to all my colleagues who are here today. Thank you for joining. And Ken is very grateful that you've joined our event today. And we hope to see you next week. Thank you.